Hey everyone, welcome again to the High Sealed. Today we'll be walking you through the most common tests you'll encounter when ordering blood work. This will be the first in a series on lab work in general. Before we talk about specifically blood work, let's just run through an overview of ordering lab work. First up, why do we order tests in the first place? It's important to always keep in mind why you're ordering something. You can usually justify ordering a test into one or more of the following categories, to screen, to diagnose, and to monitor. Always think about what you're trying to achieve by ordering a specific test, and if you can't think of a reason, maybe you shouldn't order it. What are the most common things we usually test? Blood, of course which will be the topic of the remainder of this video. You'll also see urine testing frequently. Others that are less commonly ordered, but are worthwhile knowing, and our topics we'll cover in future videos, include cerebrospinal fluid and synovial fluid. So what exactly in the blood are we looking at? Most commonly, you'll see a combination of the following. CBC, electrolytes, creatinine, and blood urea nitrogen. These tests are so frequently ordered, it's almost standard practice for just about any patient. What do we measure specifically for each, and what do they tell us though? Let's start with the classic of classics, CBC. The CBC, or complete blood count, measures just that, the things in the blood. The main components are hemoglobin, the white count, and the platelet count. Additionally, there are a number of other things measured, such as the MCV, the neutrophil and lymphocyte count, the red cell distribution width, but majority of the time, the hemoglobin, white count, and platelets are going to be the focus. What do these measurements tell us? What does a normal value tell us, and what do deviations from that indicate? Let's start with hemoglobin. We know that the hemoglobin value is a measure of the oxygen-carrying capacity of our blood, and in essence measures if tissues and organs in our body are receiving adequate oxygen, if all other things are normal. Why measure the hemoglobin? Well, in just about anyone, you want to make sure they don't have a low hemoglobin, which may mean their tissues aren't being adequately oxygenated. Complications arising from low hemoglobin, or anemia, can include ischemia and even end-organ damage. Reasons for anemia are separate into loss, decreased production, or increased destruction. Signs and symptoms you might expect to see in someone with a low hemoglobin include fatigue, lightheadedness, dizziness, and pallor. If you see any of these signs or symptoms, or you're worried about any of the aforementioned processes occurring in someone, check their hemoglobin. The leukocyte count, or white blood count, is essentially a reflection of any inflammatory and or infectious process occurring in the body. You can expect there to be elevations in the white blood count when the body is responding to a stressful process. The degree of elevation can be reflective of the severity of infection or inflammation. Following the white blood count can aid you in identifying if there's any infection or inflammation ongoing, as well as monitoring the impact of treatment as you should expect to see decreases in the count with successful response. The platelets can tell you two major things. One, it's reflective of the clotting ability. If the person has very low platelets, they are much more susceptible to bleeding, as the clotting ability is impaired. Platelets can also reflect any increase in systemic inflammation, as you will often see elevations in platelets with inflammatory processes. Monitor this to ensure that the patient isn't susceptible to bleeding, and to ensure that there aren't any underlying inflammatory processes going on that you may be missing. Electrolytes are ordered just as often as the CBC is, and for good reason. The ones you'll see are sodium, potassium, and chloride. Sodium in most cases is reflective of the intravascular fluid volume, or extracellular fluid. It is a major intravascular ion that determines ECF volume and osmolality. Decreases in sodium can usually be attributed to increased intravascular volume, diluting the sodium. And vice versa, increases in sodium are reflective of intravascular volume depletion due to increased solute relative to solvent. In reality, there are a vast number of causes for hypo and hypernatremia, but for the scope of this video, volume is an extremely important and common consideration. While sodium is a major extracellular ion, potassium is a major intracellular ion, and therefore affects cell tonicity. It is involved in neuromuscular excitability and regulation of a number of intracellular metabolic processes. Of all the electrolytes, rapid changes in potassium can be the most dangerous due to cardiac dysarrhythmias. Common causes of hyperkalemia include tissue injury, which results in increased release of potassium, renal functional impairment, which leads to decreased excretion, or transcellular shifts, secondary to acidosis. The most serious complication of hyperkalemia is cardiac arrhythmia. Hypokalemia is usually caused by increased loss, either through the gastrointestinal tract, vomiting or diarrhea, or renally, as well as through transcellular shifts secondary to alkalosis or insulin infusions or Ventolin. Similar to hyperkalemia, the most feared complication of hypokalemia are cardiac complications, specifically arrhythmias. Chloride is usually associated with sodium and is also representative of volume. You usually won't see much of a focus on chloride compared to sodium and potassium, but it'll be useful in our later topics when we talk about acids and bases and toxicology. Moving on from the electrolytes onto creatinine and urea. These are two markers used to assess renal function. Starting with creatinine, it's an end product of creatine metabolism, formed from skeletal muscle and excreted in constant amounts. It is completely filtered by the kidneys, and then it is relatively unaffected by diet, exercise, or urine volume, meaning that its clearance is a direct and accurate measure of kidney function. If kidney function suffers, you can expect creatinine to rise. Really, any renal impairment, including pre-renal, renal, and post-renal causes will all cause creatinine to rise, so this is an essential test to do. 
Urea is an end product of protein metabolism, formed in the liver and excreted by the kidneys. Like creatinine, the body's dependence on the kidneys to excrete urea makes it a useful marker to evaluate renal function. But unlike creatinine, urea is influenced by factors such as a high protein diet, variables in protein synthesis, and volume status. Given this, urea is not an ideal marker for renal function, specifically the glomerular filtration rate. However, combined with plasma creatinine, by looking at the creatinine-urea ratio, it can help differentiate pre- and post-renal etiologies. The reason the ratio is useful is because unlike creatinine, which is secreted by the kidneys nearly entirely, urea has actually reabsorbed a considerable amount in the nephrons. Therefore, if you see a urea-creatinine ratio that's super high, more than 100 to 1, then that tells you renal impairment is likely pre-renal, because urea absorption is increased to facilitate fluid reabsorption. On the other hand, if the ratio is decreased, less than 10 to 1, their injury is likely intrarenal, and because the nephrons themselves may be damaged, reabsorption of urea is impaired, thereby lowering the ratio. And that about wraps it up. The episode may have been a bit denser than others, but this is a pretty essential topic given how frequently you'll be encountering these values, and so it's important you know them well. This was The Highest Yield, my name's Waj, and we'll catch you all next time.